So, Mr. Ishinger, you are preparing to host one of the world's biggest conferences on security at the end of this week. How concerned are you that we could be witnessing a war by that time? Well, like everybody else, uh, my team and I, um, I'm personally deeply worried. Um, I wish uh, I could be confident to say that next weekend uh, we will be talking about negotiations on arms control, de-escalation mechanisms, etc. But I am as deeply worried as so many decision makers and, and, and analysts are. It is um, good that we can offer the opportunity of Munich as, a, as an informal platform for discussions. But I, I'm afraid that if uh, the Russian government continues to believe that their presence uh, is not what they, uh, what they want, uh, then of course our usefulness as, a, as an informal platform will be somewhat limited. In recent days, the US has been intensifying its warnings and it is explicitly saying that there could be a full-scale war all the way to Kiev. Do you believe that is a plausible scenario? You always have to make a distinction between the capabilities and the intentions. Regarding the capabilities, everybody knows, not only the, the intelligence community, we've all seen the satellite uh, pictures um, of the um, number of troops, equipment, ar armaments, etc., amassed around the Ukrainian border. So the capabilities for doing that exist, surely. So that must be, that must be uh, of course, a, a, a cause of enormous concern. Now, regarding the intentions, um, I would be skeptical. I, uh, um, until proven otherwise, I would think that any responsible Russian military commander, and, and I would also hope any Russian political uh, responsible leader, would think about how would you, once you have moved all your military equipment over hundreds of kilometers uh, into, let's say, up to Kiev, how are you going to keep this huge area uh, with many millions of Ukrainians under your control? You would have to establish a huge number of, you know, uh, police, or permanent stationing of, of, of military forces uh, in a country that is not, you know, that's not Liechtenstein. This is a huge country with 40 million, uh, 40 million plus inhabitants. So I would think that the mere question of, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you come to the conclusion we could take Kiev, then the question is how are we going to hold Kiev uh, for a month? for six months, for a year, or for longer? And, and how much will that cost? And how many lives might it cost over the longer term? So these types of considerations would, I would hope, lead Russians to uh, uh, not to go down that road. Now, Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, takes center stage this week. On Tuesday, he's going to be in Moscow. He's seeking de-escalation of the situation. What can he achieve that so far Joe Biden, Emmanuel Macron, many others have failed to achieve? I think the best hope we can have, and I would imagine that that is uh, his expectation, would be that he can serve to make President Putin continue what he's been doing for the last couple of weeks, namely talk. Um, in other words, uh, having this first discussion with this is the first physical meeting between the new German Chancellor and, uh, and President Putin. Um, I would hope that uh, they would arrange, they would agree that they should meet again uh, and um, to continue this discussion and that Germany certainly would want to be helpful if the Russian side is willing to talk about diplomatic solutions to the various issues that are, uh, that, that are currently uh, part of this confrontation. Um, so being able to come back from Moscow and saying to the, to the public, 
President Putin is willing to continue this discussion that I've just had with him, that would be as good a result as uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz could bring home. I, I'm sure that he would not uh, be able to come home and say, I achieved something which Joe Biden, Macron, and, 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 and all the other leaders who've recently met with President Putin, I've, I've uh, been able to talk him into something that they have not achieved. I think that is not a realistic uh, expectation. Now, the Germans and the French are trying to keep this so-called Normandy process going, where those two countries, together with the Russians and the Ukrainians, try to uh, uh, try to negotiate around these so-called Minsk agreements, which which, um, which came about back in 2015. There are totally different interpretations by the Russians and the Ukrainians of what these agreements even mean. Do you really see any prospect for hope in that process? It's difficult. It's very difficult. I mean, it is good that there is some discussion of, of w within the Normandy format, uh, uh, regrettably not at the uh, leader level or not even at the foreign minister level, but it's good that at least there is some uh, discussion going on. My own uh, thinking about this uh, is along the following lines. We uh, seem to see that President Putin if he is willing to agree uh, to, to, to talk with anyone about possible solutions, he seems to prefer the United States as his negotiating partner. That's the other nuclear superpower, etc., etc. So I would be surprised, quite frankly, if in these present circumstances the Russian side would decide to agree. Uh, a Donbass solution in this format with France and Germany separately. Um, my thought is this would only come about, whatever shape and form it would have, uh, as part of a larger package which President Putin, in my view, would want to hammer out with the American side. So my recommendation would be for my own country and France to try to include the United States, uh, whether in indirectly or, if possible, directly, uh, into this uh, Normandy format. You know, why did the Normandy format come uh, uh, into being in the, in, the, in the first place? Because at that time, in 2014, uh, it was not President Obama's ambition to get involved in these, um, uh, in these European quarrels. Uh, and the thought at that time was maybe the, the Germans and the French can handle it. Uh, the, the way things have developed, um, I believe we need American leadership. Now, there's another level to this crisis, of course, with the Russians making very fundamental demands about security, for instance, demanding that NATO no longer expand. The West is rejecting that outright on the basis of real fundamental principles. This just feels like a sort of deadlocked situation. Do you see any diplomatic way out there? Diplomatic um, solutions are only possible if you go beyond the repetition of principles. Uh, yes, indeed. I don't think that NATO can go back behind what NATO said in Bucharest uh, in 2008 that Ukraine and of course also Georgia will uh, at some point be members of NATO. We cannot say this is no longer uh, true. We, this would be tantamount to abandoning Ukraine, right? Uh, it would be a terrible shock to all my Ukrainian friends. We can't possibly say that. But we can say, and this is where it becomes a little more diplomatic and a little more concrete, we can say to President Putin, look, the last decision about Eastern enlargement of NATO that we took, you know, in a consensus manner in, in NATO, and NATO only works on a consensus basis, was in 2004. That's almost 20 years ago. All the other NATO enlargement decisions that have taken place since were to the south were regarding Montenegro, Croatia. So this is of no strategic interest to uh, Russia. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, even the famous decision in 2008 uh, 
did not lead to any concrete steps that would uh, result in membership of Ukraine in NATO. So I think there should be a way for all of us uh, uh, NATO members to reassure the Russian leadership, if this is their principal concern, to reassure the, uh, the Russian leadership uh, that there is no plan, no ambition, um, and nothing to fear about uh, next steps that uh, anyone in NATO would have regarding Ukrainian membership in NATO. Quite frankly, uh, I cannot imagine that my own country, or France, or many other uh, NATO members, would even want to discuss the concrete question of inviting uh, Ukraine into NATO uh, at this point. So I think that could be, if it's correctly done, that could be a message that hopefully would be heard in Moscow to de, uh, what's the word, to, to de-escalate, to start a de-escalation effort. In your report released this week ahead of the conference, you describe a major trend that you call helplessness that is particularly uh, affecting Western democracies. Helplessness, the sense of, uh, of, of an inability to tackle major challenges. How dangerous is this phenomenon? It's uh, extremely disconcerting for, uh, for us because if, uh, if this concept, which comes from you know, psychology, from, from, from medicine, uh, if you apply that to uh, our international situation, this is exactly what we are trying to do by using this concept of uh, learned helplessness, or as we now say, unlearning helplessness, um, you actually condemn yourself, your society, your country, your group of countries, to um, regard your own role as that of a victim. Others are deciding about your future, uh, and you are, quote unquote, helpless. You have no capacity to determine which way it's, it's going to go. And, uh, you know, we've had long discussions about this. Uh, I am afraid that many of our citizens, not just in Germany, around the, the Western world in general and beyond, uh, people believe that when they hear about the, 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 the climate scare, the danger that uh, the warming global climate will, you know, start killing uh, humanity, uh, people express this sense of helplessness. Can we do something about it? Well, we, eat a few, we, we don't eat uh, stuff that comes from, uh, from faraway countries in order to limit international traffic. That is actually almost also an expression of helplessness because we don't seem to be able to, to do anything about the uh, increasing numbers of coal burning uh, plants in China or in India or in, other, in major other parts of the world. So we need to overcome and this is a task not for the foreign policy specialists, this is a task for the leaders of democratic countries to instill in, our, in, 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 in the brains, in the minds of our citizens, the um, determination that we have the power to take our future into our own hands and make sure that our children will not live in a, in a, in a desert, or our grandchildren, but in a, under, under normal, quote unquote, circumstances, and that we are capable of preventing war, uh, and that we are going to be able to um, combat uh, pandemic phenomena, uh, which, we were, which we had not even understood uh, a couple of years ago. Now the world is discovering, is beginning to discover, one of the first was Bill Gates, who raised the, 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 the specter of, uh, of global pandemics. Now we've learned a lesson, and, and I'm quite confident that if our governments apply themselves to it, and if the citizens understand that this is in their own immediate and direct interest, the global community can, of course, develop instruments to make sure that the next pandemic can be fought more effectively, more quickly, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, more rapid procedures to develop vaccines, if that's uh, the, 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 the possible solution. 
than uh, we have seen in the past. We are capable of doing a lot. And just simply this discovery of these modern vaccines, these mRNA uh, uh, vaccination methods, is a discovery that even scientists could not have predicted a decade ago. So humanity is capable, and we need to relearn uh, our capacity to act. We need to, uh, uh, to leave behind this sense of collective helplessness. That's, the, that's our message. So it's actually, it goes far beyond uh, foreign policy. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a societal issue. It's almost a philosophical issue. I would like to take one example from the current security environment. Uh, of course, what happened in Afghanistan last year, the debacle after 20 years of, of, of war, pulling out and the Taliban taking over, now we see the risk of famine taking place uh, there. Um, now there's a lot of focus on, on Western military missions in the Sahel region in, in Northern Africa. Um, Mali, for instance. The West has been heavily involved, including Germany, for many years now. There is no security there. What do you think are the lessons for that situation? Do you think Germany and other countries should be pulling out, or would that speak of a sort of defeatism in the line of the helplessness you talk about? Well, quite frankly, the situation in, in the Sahel is, of course, a, a situation with many aspects. There are military aspects, there are poverty aspects, there are terrorism aspects, etc. And I don't think, I don't personally believe that a military contingent, whether it's peacekeeping or actually war fighting, is going to do the, do the trick and, and, and create peace in the region. What I think is, uh, in terms of a larger framework for a solution, look, almost 20 years ago, the three foreign ministers of the United Kingdom, France and Germany, decided to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to agree on a, on a collective way to deal with the emerging Iranian nuclear problem. Fifteen years later, we, we had the JCPOA, the, the nuclear accord between Iran on one side and the international community on the other side, 2015. That accord came about because the five permanent powers of the United Nations and other countries, such as my own country, Germany, worked together. China, Russia, United States, UK, France, Germany, and, and, of, and actually the, the entire uh, European Union got together, agreed on the strategy, and, and got this thing done. So my question is this. If we agree, if we agreed then that a nuclear capacity by Iran was going to be a danger to humanity and certainly to the West, uh, why can't we agree among all those participants that the preservation or the recreation of stability in the Sahel region, actually in Africa, uh, in the entire, entire African continent, the uh, prevention of a uh, next wave of large migratory uh, movements, the uh, eradication of a major source of terrorism uh, and, and, and fundamental I Islamism, etc., etc., requires the same collective approach. In other words, what I'm suggesting to you is that it's not going to be France and Germany or France and other members of the EU. This requires the cooperation of Russia, of China, of the United States, and therefore, I think this is a matter for the entire United Nations community. Uh, that's what the United Nations was created for in the first place, right? We haven't used this instrument appropriately in, re in recent years. And I would hope that the major powers would actually empower Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, and the Security Council of the United Nations to take collective action. This is the perfect place to demonstrate that the international community can actually deal with major challenges to international peace and security. That's what the UN Charter says. So I think a UN approach, not a, not, not a, uh, you know, a separate uh, European approach, that's too little. This is a large problem. It needs a large answer. 
Wolfgang Ischinger, many thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much.